Here are William Lane Craig and Ben Shapiro again to try to make excuses for the nasty stuff the Bible endorses. So who's to say that the moral values of a society that discriminates uh, against people and oppresses people is worse than one which is liberal and tolerant. Well, if there is a God, who's to say that a society that obeys God is better than a society that does not? God? Doesn't that seem a little circular? I don't see any need for anyone to say that any action is better than any other in any objective sense. The only thing I see any reason to care about is what is tolerable to our consciences and what is not. It may be tempting to want there to be a God who dictates morality so everyone has a universal standard to which they can refer in the event of moral disputes, but how do we resolve disputes between what God says and what is tolerable to our consciences? If God and my conscience differ on a moral issue, why should I defer to what God says? Because God says so? You see the problem here, right? We just sort of assume that the, the liberal values um, are the ones that would be objective. I don't. I don't think any values are objective, nor do I care. I'm not going to do or put up with anything that's not tolerable to my conscience, regardless of what any independent standard of morality says. When in fact they're just as relativistic as any of the other ones on atheism. I would argue that even if there is a God, his morality would also be just as relativistic. There is no objective, non-circular reason why God's morality ought to be the one we follow. So if we need God to be the anchor point for objective moral values and duties, we don't need an anchor point for objective moral values and duties. And even if we did, God, who is a subject and whose morality is thus subjective, wouldn't suffice as one. We cannot escape the question when thinking of moral right and wrong, well, what does God think of this? Even if God existed, why would that be any easier to escape than the question, what does Macho Man Randy Savage think of this? There's no more of an objective, non-circular reason to obey what God thinks than there is to obey what anyone else thinks. One may retort that God is omniscient and Randy isn't, but so what? What objective reason is there to prefer the orders of an omniscient God than someone who is not omniscient? Is it because an omniscient God says that it's better? Again, that's circular. And if God proscribes something, it seems to me that's entirely within his right. Well, anybody is free to prescribe whatever they like. The question is whether anyone else has any objective obligation to obey such a prescription. There is no objective, non-circular reason anyone must obey God's prescriptions. If God were to say, thou shalt not eat beans, uh, or thou shalt not eat pork, that would be our moral duty. Why? Again, what objective, non-circular reason is there to obey what God says? And we should obey it. That is his prerogative as the moral lawgiver and the supreme good. What does it mean to say that God is the supreme good? If God is the standard of goodness itself, then saying that God is good is vacuously tautological. Saying God is good seems to mean nothing more than saying God is godly. If good is whatever God says it is, then there is no objective, non-circular reason why anyone ought to do what is good. And so if God says, my plan for human sexuality is heterosexual marriage, that's his prerogative. And there is no basis for calling that, I think, into question. Well, my basis for calling that into question is that there is no non-circular argument for the assertion that it is objectively true. So let's talk about the evolution of morality. And I want to go back to slavery for just a second. So it is true that, that Hebrew enslavement, the Jewish enslavement of, of others is really more indentured servitude. Israelite enslavement of other Israelites is indentured servitude. An important difference between indentured servitude and chattel slavery is that while you can force an indentured servant to work for you, you don't legally own the person. Chattel slavery is when you do outright own the person. Israelite enslavement of non-Israelites is chattel slavery. Those folks are straight up regarded as property. Leviticus 25.46 says, Ye may make them an inheritance for your children after you to hold for a possession. That is the very definition of chattel slavery. And there's a whole section in, I believe it's it's Numbers or Leviticus, I think it's Leviticus maybe, where, where it, it speaks to 
is specifically about the slave who doesn't want to leave and you're supposed to pierce his ear on the doorpost as a punishment for him not wanting to leave and all of this. <laughs> oh, well, that sounds much more humane than American slavery. I'm much more comfortable with a God who finds that to be morally acceptable. Um, but by the same token, op- sl- enslavement of people who are not inside the, the you know, Israelite, inside the Jewish kind of tradition, mm-hmm. that's not proscribed. So the idea of war captives is mm-hmm. obviously taken into account and not banned. So certain things are banned in the Bible, certain things are not banned. Now, the way that biblical believers have practiced over time is that very early in the church's history, they're already starting to eliminate slavery, although not for yeah. people who are captured. And then over time, the West is the first place to eliminate slavery altogether, specifically citing the sections of the Bible that talk about human freedom and the innate value of every human being. So is that an evolution of morality or is that a realization of a fundamental principle that was originally given to people who couldn't necessarily understand the full extent of the principle. Oh, I think I, I think it's the latter. So the all-powerful God of the Bible didn't have the power to write a book that condemned slavery in a way that its readers could immediately understand. It condemned slavery all along, but it took people thousands of years to realize what it was actually saying. This is another example of apologists insisting that the perfect, infallible word of God was written by someone with the communication skills of a blobfish who just had a root canal. And I love the way you put it. I think that's nicely put. Jesus said something very much like this with respect to Old Testament regulations on divorce. Uh, They asked him whether or not it was lawful to divorce a woman for any reason. And Jesus said, Moses allowed you to write a certificate of of divorce, but it was not so from the beginning. And he cites then the creation story of Genesis of Adam and Eve uh, and said, what God has put together and let not man put asunder. So what Jesus was saying there was that the law of Moses was a temporary uh, prescription accommodating the hardness of heart of the people at the time, but it didn't represent the perfect will of God for human marriage, which was grounded in the creation story. Exodus says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, so if he is willing and able to harden someone's heart, why was he not willing or not able to soften the hearts of slave owners? Or in Craig's example, folks who wanted to get divorced. So how exactly do we determine when we have moved beyond the biblical text in terms of the evolution of that morality? When are we fulfilling uh, a broader goal that was, that, you know, was kind of held back by temporary constraints? And when are we moving utterly beyond it? And again, here I'm thinking of same-sex marriage. So Mm -hmm. when it comes to same-sex marriage, the argument is now being made by people in liberal churches, including including Pete Buttigieg, who's running for president, that basically Jesus was seeking equal respect for everyone. He cared about the least of these. And the prescriptions on homosexuality were really more, and homosexual activity, were not eternal precepts, but were really attempting to crack down on the, the... promiscuity of the time, or they were temporary expedients. Yeah, I I think that's clearly false. It seems very fortunate for William Lane Craig and most churches today that they exist at the exact moment when the true will of God is perfectly understood. Those old churches who thought slavery was good, they didn't understand what God was saying. Or they were following a temporary expediency that God made to accommodate the hardness of people's hearts. And the newer churches who think that gay marriage is okay, they don't understand either. It is the theology that Craig was taught that very conveniently got it just right. He and the apologists he agreed with subscribe to a theology that's like the porridge that Goldilocks chose. When you look at these uh, regulations, both in the Old Testament and then they're repeated in the New Testament in the strongest terms in Romans chapter 1, um, there's no doubt that Paul is thinking of this as a moral law that has abiding significance. The acquiescence to slavery is also both in the Old and New Testaments. In Ephesians 6.5, Paul, supposedly, but Ephesians was likely a forgery, says slaves be obedient to your human masters. Does that not have abiding significance? And it's grounded again, I think, in the creation story, that God has created human sexuality, he's created man and woman, Uh, in such a way that the fulfillment of that relationship will take place within the safety and security of a heterosexual 
marriage. Well, where does Matthew 19, 12 fit into that? In that passage, Jesus seems to talk with some nuance about gender. In that passage, he says, for there are eunuchs who are born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Here, Jesus seems willing to accommodate at least some folks who fall outside of the rigid construct of man plus woman equals baby. If every Everything should relate back to Adam and Eve. How does that relate to the way people were created? To everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.